We're talking about skin in the game today. We gave it that title because you need to get some skin in the game. Some of you will be watching those guys play football, but 11 on this side, 11 on that side. I'm telling you, those boys are putting a lot of skin in the game. They're going to leave some skin on the field. But I thought I'd talk about during this season of our church, why don't we put some skin in the game? I'm going to draw your attention to Ruth chapter 1. We're going to read the entire chapter. It's such a beautiful story. Ruth chapter 1, if you want to look there, it's the eighth book in the Bible. And we're talking about change. Change is on the way. Somebody say change is on the way. When you pray for change, I want you to get this. When you pray for change, God answers with disruption. Watch out now. <laughs> but we cannot allow the disruption to become a distraction. We pray for change. Now we have a disruption. Sometimes the disruption becomes the distraction. When in fact, God sent the disruption to bring about change. If you don't want disruption, don't pray for change. Because we can't have change without it. We can't have change without a disruption. You can't have a baby and go back to your old waistline you can't build a building without disturbing the environment. I mean, what's going on? It's disruption. It's change. In the book of Ruth, it is a book about disruption. I love this book. I may camp out a little bit more in it, but how we handle disruption, how these characters in this story handles the disruption determines how far you can go. If you can't handle the distraction that disruption brings, you will be sidelined while everybody else is taken off. Ah, I don't know about you, but I want to go a little further in life. And if the, basically the word is, if you can't handle disruption, stop praying for change. We cannot allow the disruption to become the distraction. Somebody say amen. amen. So, um, too many say, well, I, you know, I've been praying for change, but man, I didn't want all these problems. Stop praying for change then. And I just, you know, when Nehemiah was building the walls back in the old day and, and he, the walls of Jerusalem had fallen down and he went to rebuild them, a couple of boys, Sanballat and Tobiah, they were sent by the devil and, and they tried to get him off that wall, said, get off that wall and quit building this wall, and they gave him, they pestered him. They tried a hundred ways to get him off that wall, and Nehemiah said, no way, Jose, I am staying on this wall. It's what God told me to do. I got a disruption going on. You guys are a distraction, so get up on out of here. We're going to finish this wall. If you're taking notes, write this one down, because disruption comes to us all. It comes to us all. Poor people, and they think, man, if I just had more money, I wouldn't have any problem. And there wouldn't be any disruptions. Rich people think, man, what it would be like to be poor again. I wouldn't have all these disruptions going on in my life. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're, if you're pretty. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you got a lot of money. Disruption comes to attractive people. Well, she's pretty. She never has any problems whatsoever. Uh-uh. You just talk to her a little while and she'll tell you all of her problems. No one is exempt from disruption. Nobody gets away from it. And how we adapt during a disruption determines what God can do with us. And so what are you doing with your own disruption? What are you doing with those little foxes that are spoiled on your vines? What are you doing with those addictions? What are you doing with, with that, with that self-defeating habit? I'm glad you came to church. There's some of you listening to me on, in the airways. I'm glad you're, you're queuing in this morning because, well, pastor, you, if you only knew how many problems I had, well, bring your problems to Jesus. You don't, you don't know, pastor, I'm fighting, I'm fighting same-sex attraction. Bring your same-sex attraction to church. Oh, pastor, you hadn't heard about me. I, I got this pornography addiction. Bring your pornography addiction to church. Bring your rusty hide to the feet of Jesus and let's just go ahead and have church anyway. 
Because see, you're getting distracted. You're getting these disruptions and your mind games that are going on. But I'm telling you here, you, you gotta be nimble if you're gonna follow God. You gotta be nimble with this thing called change because I, I know that there's distractions, I know there's disruptions, I know there's problems, but I'm gonna keep my face. Jesus had his face set like a flint for Jerusalem. I'm gonna keep my eye on the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I'm not gonna let any of these foxes that spoils the vine. I'm telling you what, you, got, you can be the smartest person in the room, and if you're not flexible, you're going to get sidetracked. You're going to have a disruption. And in order to survive the vicissitudes of life, you have to be able to turn on a dime. Mm, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm telling somebody, get ready. Change is on the way, and when it comes, don't be distracted by it. Be ready to turn on a dime. Get ready. Somebody say like the old bishop said, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. So here we go. Ruth chapter 1. That was just the introduction. Ruth chapter one, I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. In those days when judges rule, there was a famine in the land from Bethlehem in Judea. Together with his wife and his two sons, they went to live a little while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife was Naomi, and the name of the two sons, Milon and Kilion. They were Ephraimites from Bethlehem of Judea. They went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, he died. And she was left with two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. And then Malion and Kilion also died. I mean, you know, that's a bad 10 years in this woman's life. And Naomi now is left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughter-in-laws prepared to return home from there. With her two daughter-in-laws, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road to take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-laws, go back, each of you, go to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown the dead and to me. May the Lord grant each of you that you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you and your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Somebody said, amen. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I have a husband tonight and then give birth to sons, will you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than it is for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. Naomi's struggling. She lost three men. The Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this, they wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred up because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Her name means pleasant one. Can this be the pleasant one? Don't call me Naomi, she said to them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law. Watch this next part. Arriving in Jerusalem, as the barley harvest was beginning, she stepped into a time with all of her troubles 
into a time when it's harvest time. Somebody say harvest time. So Ruth chapter one, I mean, it's hard to preach this because you love the story so much you want to tell the story more than you want to preach the story. In chapter one, Naomi leaves Bethlehem, means the house of bread. That's where she grew up and, and she takes off because there's a famine hitting Bethlehem and they got to get out of there. They're well to do, they got some money and so she's got to go to another country. This, experience, this uh, famine that they're experiencing is just a little bit too much, so they got to go. They, they may have said to one another, I'll never leave Bethlehem. Mm, Bethlehem was where I was born. Uh, Bethlehem, sweet Bethlehem. But I'm telling you what, famine changed everybody's plans because if the famine gets bad enough, everybody will migrate. If the famine gets bad enough, I mean, you'll leave town in that old rust bucket of a car that takes an oil, quart of oil every hundred miles. I mean, you'll leave in a, in a shoddy car if there's no food in Bethlehem. And that's about what happened here. So she and her husband decide, we got to get out of here. We got to go across to Moab. We heard there is food over there. They have risk. They have risk the rejection of the Moabites. They didn't speak the same language. It's across the desert. They risked the rejection of the Moabites rather than to die in their current situation. You see, some people are in a situation just like that. But you're so comfortable with where you are, you got to be careful that your comfort level will not allow you to get to the next level. Maybe God has allowed this disruption in your life. Maybe it's become a distraction and all you can think about it is emotionally, oh man, why did all this happen to me? Why does all this happen to me? Uh, no, 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 no. Don't be distracted by the disruption because God may have brought the disruption to get you off a of dead center and get you into what is called next. But there's something about us we all love propping up this comfortable lifestyle. How many of y'all got an easy boy at your house? You love, you love getting in a hot shower. I mean, you just got all your creature comforts and there, there you are. Not Naomi. Naomi says, I'm getting out of Bethlehem. If I got to crawl, if I got to scratch my way out of this, if I got to ride a tricycle out of town, I'm going to get out of Bethlehem because I can see some things are coming. I will not live like this. I will not die in famine. I'm getting out of here. I was at the, uh, getting a haircut the other day and this woman had just died in Visalia. She's 101. And then I asked the hairdresser, I said, Jill, and I said, what was the, what was the most, what, what do you remember about her? She said, she always told me, change before you have to. Isn't that a good word from a 101 year old? change before you have to. Naomi is saying, boys, we're going to change before we have to because there's going to come a time there's going to be nothing left here. Let's change before we have to. Somebody say change before we have to. I think old Naomi was a radical person. I think her and Elimelech, they were so radical. And she said, I'm just going to take my chances. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to go to Moab. I don't know those people, but I'd rather take my chances in Moab rather than die right here. And I tell you what, I believe old, old, uh, Naomi was a praiser as well. She said, you know what? We love Yahweh and we're going to praise him. You know, one of the best things you can do when you're going through hell is learn how to praise God. You know, one of the best things you can do is to get your flesh in line with the word of God. Now, I'm going to praise him until I calm my nerves down. I'm going to praise him and I'm going to make hell nervous like they're making me nervous right now. I'm going to praise him until my flesh lines up with the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to praise myself out of a problem. Somebody needs to hear that because the devil's getting you because you keep turning inward and inward and inward. Oh, woe is me. No, no, no. Woe is him. Lift up your eyes into the hills from which cometh your help. Somebody needs to praise God or our flesh is going to take over. And by the time we get, to, oh, I better stop. So she goes, she goes and she goes over to Moab and boy, you know the story. 
My, my, my. She gets into Moab and everything is just going wrong and, and her husband dies the first uh, uh, couple of years and her boys goes out and she uh, marries a couple of gals and, and then they die and man, this is all in 10 years. She's lost every man she's ever loved. And now she's getting up in years and she's thinking, what is, what is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. God doesn't like me anymore. God's reached his hand out against me. I don't know what I did wrong by leaving sweet Bethlehem. But girls, I got to go. I got to go. And so she came to her daughter-in-law. She, she said, I'm leaving. And her daughter-in-law said, I will go with you. I will go with you. Finally, she talked him out of it. So she said, no, girls, you need to go back to your own, you need to go back to your own family. You need to go back to your own people. And, and finally, Orpha said, okay, I'm going to go back. I don't know where it is on my outline, but some people you got to hit delete. You guys got that statement. Can you throw that up there? Hmm. If you want to go deep, you're just going to have to hit delete on some people. You know, when I was younger, I used to think, man, if I could get all my buddies to go with me, if I want to get all my buddies to go with me, no, no. Kiss Orpha goodbye. One kiss, and that's the last we hear of old Orpha. She wasn't nimble enough to make this change. I mean, if you want to walk with God, you got to be ambidextrous. You got to be able to turn. You got to be moving on the left side, on the right side. You got to do all kinds of things. But I want to say something about Naomi and Ruth and the season of life that they're in. When you walk with God, you got to be ready to change it doesn't matter if you're four or 40 or 80, you got to be ready to change as the season changes. Hmm. The children in the desert, they had to change. As soon as they saw the pillar cloud move, they had to move. Maybe they weren't feeling like moving that day. Maybe uh, God said, move, it's time to move. Orpha decided, I don't want to change. I'd rather deal with the devils I know than the devils I don't know. I wonder how many people do that. I'm just going to stay with what I know rather than the change is too much. The change is too big. Ah, you see, Naomi has lived a lifetime. She's got, she's a little bit more seasoned than Ruth. I mean, she, let's put it this way. She's in the wintertime season and Ruth is in the summertime season. She has buried three men, her husband, her two sons. I mean, She's got losses like you and I will never, ever experience in this room. Now, Ruth is in the summer season, and this, I think this is good. If you people that are in the summer season, if you could find some people in the winter season and you can join together, that's where wisdom takes place. When winter and summer can hang out together, there, even though there's a different point of view, there is wisdom in the house. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Young people, don't throw the old people away just yet. I mean, they've been, they've been there, they've done some of the things you did, and I tell you what, they're old enough and they're a little bit more treacherous. They can tell you how to fix somebody real quick. Oh, y'all not hearing me on that one. But Naomi teaches, I think, Ruth a very important lesson. Don't make permanent decisions off temporary emotions. Yeah, girls, we've had loss. You've lost your husband. I've lost my husband. We've all lost husbands here. But we could stay and we could, we could stay here and we could camp out and, and I know it's tough and, and I know it's hard, but um, you gotta be careful that we don't allow our emotions of the moment to destroy our lives. You got to be careful that your emotions don't do something stupid while you're emotional that's going to give you a lifetime of regret. How many people have done that? They fell out of love. He left me. She left me. I think I'll just shoot her. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> 
There's more fish in the sea, brother. <laughs> Don't be shooting nobody. <laughs> Sometimes all emotional people can think about is who touched them last. And it's, most, it's amazing to pastor church and, and some people are real emotional and it's all about who did them wrong last. And that is the entirety of their discussion. I want to tell you something. If you ever catch yourself and that's all you talk about is another person, you are a small-minded person. Small-minded people talk about other people. Great-minded people talk about faith and events and goals and things we're going to do. They're not going to spend all of their life in an emotional stir. You are not who touched you last. You are not who did you wrong last. That is not you. <laughs> so here's Naomi. Her name means pleasant one, but she's changed her name. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. I don't know if I would ever do that. <laughs> but even though she's bitter, we learn another lesson from old Naomi. She's walking. She's talking. She said, girls, I'm getting out of here. I'm going back to Bethlehem. Ah, I heard there's some bread in the house of Bethlehem again. I'm going to go to Bethlehem. And she gives us a lesson that even though I'm bitter, I can keep walking. Even though uh, things are going wrong, I'm going to keep walking. I am not going to stay here. I may be hurt, but I'm walking this thing out. I may be bitter, but I'm going to keep on walking. You may have cut me. You may have stole my money. You may have told people wrong things about me, but I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to keep walking, and I'm going to keep walking. So that's a word for somebody. Just keep on walking. You're not the sum of your emotions. You're not the sum of what happened to you last. You're not the sum of what touched you last. No, you got a God in heaven above. He's got a plan for you. It's a plan to bless you. He's got plans to <laughs> prosper you. God has a plan. Just lift up your eyes and get a hold of the plan. Sometimes we just lose all hope when we see all hell breaking loose. You heard about the the, the donkey that fell into the well and he started hee-hawing and crying out to his master to come get him out of that well hole. And so the farmer goes over there and the old donkey's down in that well. He said, there's no way I can ever get that donkey out of that well. He's too far down there. So he called all of his neighbor friends over and he said, Anybody got an idea how to get a donkey out of a well? He said, that donkey's gone. Donkey's down there crying out, save me, get me out of this well. So the farmer made a decision. Well, before anybody else falls in the hole, we better well cover it up. Everybody grab a shovel. So all the neighbors were grabbing their shovels and they were throwing dirt in the hole. And the old donkey started crying out louder and louder. Quit doing that to me. Went louder and louder. And then all of a sudden he stopped. And they kept putting that dirt in that hole, putting the dirt in the hole, putting the dirt in the hole. And then they looked down there and the old donkey, every time a shovel of dirt would hit him on the back, he would take it off and he'd step on it. What am I saying? He wouldn't let the dirt settle on him. He made his dirt his stepping stool to get out of there and pretty soon they could see the old head of the donkey and pretty soon the old donkey jumped out of the hole. Why? You got to take your problems and let them be your stair sail. You got to walk on out of there. Somebody just keep on walking. Keep on walking. <laughs> Zig Ziglar said, it's not what happens to you. It's not what happens to you that determines how far you will go in life. It is what? How you handle it. Mm, 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 mm. Naomi has taught us a great lesson about life here. You know, I'm going to keep on walking. I lost my husband. I lost my kids, but I'm going to keep on walking. Mm, I've had some emotional bouts along the way, and I mean, I, I'm having a fight with God right now, but I'm going to keep on walking. Uh, I may be hurt. I'm going to keep on walking. doesn't matter if you're bitter. Keep on walking. You know, you and I are very blessed to be in this room today. 
A million people have died of COVID and you and I were not one of them. Why are we still here? Because we keep on walking. Because he's got a plan. He's got a plan. He got a plan. Now Ruth, Ruth is now leaving her land. She's got to turn a page in her thinking too. Now she arrives into Bethlehem and she's in a foreign land. Hmm. A lot of times when you step into your destiny, it will feel foreign. Sometimes when you step into your destiny, it feels like foreign land. You may be coming into your destiny, but you feel like an immigrant. That's okay. We've all been there. We've all been somewhere where we, we were in over our head, but somebody say, but God. Your, 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 your destiny will make you feel like an immigrant because it's not your history. But God does not want you to stay in your history. God has a destiny and you ought to feel a little bit funny. I had a kid come interview me this week, ask me all kinds of questions. And I said, you know what you need to do is get around some people that scare you. I said, I said one, one day I, I learned that when I was smoking dope at 17 years of age and I was out on Blueberry Hill with all my beer, beer drinking buddies and we were getting high and I looked around to them knuckleheads and I said, you know what? I'm the smartest one here. I got to get another room. <laughs> if you're the smartest one in the room, get you another room, baby. If you're the smartest one in your camp, you need to change camps. You need to get around somebody that scares you a little bit that isn't associated with your history, but it's associated with your destiny. Success doesn't always feel like success when you first walk into it because it feels a little strange because I haven't been this way before. But immigrants know something that some people don't know. They know to be thankful for anything that they get. Oh, you get an immigrant going into a new country, I'm telling you, they're just thankful for anything that someone drops along the way. Oh, thank you that you bless me. Thank you. I'm here to tell somebody you're walking into your destiny and you're feeling a little nervous because you hadn't been this way before. I just say, just lift a hand up and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing me. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I just want to say, thank you, Lord. I give the Lord some praise because I'm deep. I'm headed into my destiny. Mm. If you can have an immigrant spirit in the kingdom of God, it'll make you praise him. It'll make you praise him because you're grateful for anything you get from the Lord. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I think and I believe that if I could just get people to learn how to praise God, you can get through any disruption, any distraction. It's going to cost you some skin in the game. You're going to have to get your knuckles all bunged up. But I'm telling you what, if you'll just praise him, it'll calm your nerves down. If you'll just praise him, it'll put your mind, your mind in the right thinking. If you'll just praise him, all those devils working against you are getting nervous and they don't want to, the longer you praise God, the less they want to be around you. The longer you praise God, those old demons just sort of go and find someone else to mess with. And one of these days, you're going to find yourself in freedom land because you praised yourself all the way to freedom. Oh, somebody clap your hands like that means something. <laughs> You got five more minutes. The Bible says that, that whew, I got to preach this again when I get to preach again. The Bible says that in the King James Version, it says that she just happened. The King James, the old King James says hap. She just hap to light upon a field belonging to Boaz. Well, when I read that word hap, it, it just, that word hat means surprisingly, I just stepped into something. I, I, it was sort of accidental, but I'm telling you, if you walk with God, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I mean, come on, somebody. You can walk with God and be as confused as a termite in a yo-yo, but keep on walking with God. Walk with God, walk with God, and one day you're just gonna hap 
Whoo, where am I? You're getting your stumble on now. I'm stumbling a little bit. I just stumbled into my destiny. Oh, this is what he called me for. Oh, you're not stumbling now. You're stepping into your destiny. This is not your history. Come on, somebody. This time for someone just to find out that God is for them and not against them. <laughs> Someone saw her. You know, in the Old Testament, you were supposed to leave a little leftovers at the edge of the field. They're harvesting barley. You're supposed to leave a little on the edge for poor people to come out and get them. And that's what Ruth was coming out to do. They were totally broke. One thing I like about Ruth, she's not sitting at home waiting for someone to call her up and ask her out on a date. Who are these? No, I can't go there. You got to get out of your house sometime and make yourself available. Why do you want to stay up in your house and get on that computer all the time and just say, nobody loves me. Nobody's ever going to ask me out on a date. Nobody knows you're alive. Ruth got out of her house and she went down to this man's field and she made herself useful. I got to pick up a little barley so we can have something to eat tonight. And when she was picking up that barley, someone saw her. And then the boss man came by. Boy. Boaz said, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Who that chicky D over there? Mm, she got some fine looking eyeballs. Woo. <laughs> well, boss, she's been there all morning, man. She's worked, she works as good as anybody. She only came to the hut once, and man, she has put it out. And he said, hey, leave a little extra for her. Leave a little extra for her. People are having conversations about Ruth that she knows nothing about. I'm here to tell you, people are talking about you right now. People that can bless you are talking about you right now. Someone's having a conversation about you right now. Why don't you just make yourself look like you're busy, like you're doing something for the kingdom of God? Get, somebody is talking about you that can promote you. She didn't know those conversations were going on. She went, and I'm going to fast forward. I'll come back with this in a couple weeks. She went from picking up stuff, and then she owned the very field that she was an immigrant, foreigner, didn't understand the language, nothing. I'm here to tell you, God wants you to start owning some stuff. God wants every one of you to own some stuff. You've been praying about it. You've been studying it over. You've been thinking about it. I'm here to tell you, why don't you own some stuff already? If God is your God. Some preacher asked me, I was on some kind of a Zoom with a bunch of pastors this week, and they were asking me questions. How'd you do this? How'd you do that? What'd you do? This? They said, and they were signing me off. They said, what's the last thought you got for me? I said, well, put my pretty teeth into that. I said, whatever you're thinking, it's too small. And one of those guys was building an auditorium seat thousand. I looked at him straight now. I said, I'm telling you right now, pastor, whatever you're thinking, it is too small. What any of us are thinking in this room, it is too small. If you're thinking about getting you a, a part-time job uh, at McDonald's, you're thinking it's too small. If you're thinking about getting a full-time job at Arby's, you're thinking it's too small. You ought to start thinking, I'm going to be the manager. One day I'm going to own me one of these puppies. One day I'm going to have me some employees. One day I'm going to be at large and in charge. That didn't go over too well. <clears throat> too, many, too many of you are still on your stim stimulus check, I see I'm not running for office. <laughs> you know what? I can say anything I want to say at this stage in my life, can I? <laughs> Owners, you need to own something. But did y'all get that last line on there? I don't even know where I am, but throw that last one up there so I know where I am. Yesterday's prayers are today's miracles, but you got to own it. Right. 
You've got to own it. You want to talk about legacy? You want to talk about legacy? A guy asked me this week, he said, I'm thinking about leaving a legacy. I said, what do you mean? He's up. I said, because legacy and inheritance is totally different. I said, you got kids, you got a lot of money. I said, what are you going to do? Give all that money to those kids? Let me say something to you before you do that. If you give more to them than you put inside them, when you give it to them, they won't know what to do with what you gave them because they had nothing inside them. You need to learn to be an owner because God's going to, we, we prayed, we prayed, we prayed yesterday's prayers or today's miracles. Now we're in a place that's a little scary, but you got to own that level. You can't just wimp out on this level. God, God brought you this far. God put you at this place. You own it, baby. Own it. What does it mean to be an owner? Owner owner means that the buck stops here. If it's broke, I got to fix it. Renters don't think like owners. Renters will say, I got to call somebody to fix this. Matter of fact, I'll kick the door if I want to. Owners don't think that away. Renters think that away. Maybe, and I'm done, maybe you need to own your relationship with God better. Maybe, huh? Are you renting a relationship with God? Who? Are you just renting a relationship with God? Why don't you just go all in? Well, that's scary. Change is on the way. Put some skin in the game. Disruption will come. Distractions will come. Put your emotions in check and own it, baby. And your relationship with God, it's something you cannot outsource. You can't call a subcontractor to build this part of your life. You got to own it. Somebody say you got to own it. They arrived in Bethlehem. It was harvest time. It was harvest time. You may have shown up bitter today. You may have shown up hurt. But I'm here to tell you, I hear a sound. It's harvest time. That's right. Come on. Come on. You don't want to be all bitter and hurt and downcast when everybody else is harvested. Right. Ruth and Naomi had every reason to stay home and cry and cry and cry and cry. But Ruth said, I've got to go eat. I'm not going. It's harvest time. We got we to gotta get busy now. So I finish. If you're bitter, if you're hurt, if you're mad at God, Naomi was mad at God, but she kept walking. That's the best advice I can give you. If you're mad at God, keep on walking. Keep on walking. Don't cuss him. Just keep on walking. Bless him. If you can bless God when you don't feel like it, that's right. baby, that's a ticket out of every painful situation you have ever experienced. I want everybody to bow your hearts with me. I'm done. I'm going to pray a prayer for someone here that needs to get right with God. If you're sitting in this room and you're away from God, you're watching online, you're away from God, you're listening on the radio, you're incarcerated. It doesn't matter where you are. If you're not right with God, I'm the preacher. Your mama's been praying for her. Because I'm here to tell you, there's only one way to heaven. Jesus says, no one comes unto the Father except by me. You got to stop off the cross of Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. You got to do this or you'll never get into your harvest. You got to get right with God or the rest doesn't work. None of this works if you don't get right with God. If you're in this room, you say, Pastor, I, I hear you. I got to get right with God. 
If you're in this room, you want to get right with God, just raise your hand. Say, that's me, Pastor. Just sort of wave at me. Yes, God bless you. Wave at me. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you up there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Many of you watching online, don't go get a cup of coffee right now. This, this is the difference between now and eternity for your soul. You need to get right with God. Our whole church is going to pray this prayer, inviting you to come to the Lord. But if you really mean it, ah, if you really want it, pray this prayer with us and get right with Jesus. Let's pray it together, church. Lord Jesus, I invite you to be Lord of my life. From this day forward, I want to walk with God. You died for me. I'm going to live for you. Please forgive all my sins. Take this guilt away. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and tell me what to do. I'm all yours. I love you, Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen and amen. 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 I'm going to pray one more prayer before we go. I feel, I sense there's somebody watching me right now that you've been in a very hurtful situation. Something hurt you deeply. I just, it, it, and it's really deep. It's, it's, it's almost taking you out kind of hurt. I want to pray a prayer for all the hurt going on in the room, uh, all the bitterness, because I'm telling you, life happens. Where was God? God was still there. Life just happened. And there's an enemy that works against us. Life happens. God says, come to him and he'll help you. If you're struggling with somebody or something or you're a little bit bitter in spirit, just sort of wave at me and I'll pray for you this morning. If you've got a situation going on, you got to get through. Father, I just pray for all the hurt. Hmm. That which the enemy meant for destruction, I say, Lord, turn it for good today. Today's a good day. Let this be the Super Bowl of their soul to where they win and they get out of this disruption that became a distraction. Holy Spirit, breathe on everyone. I speak to that bitterness and I say, be bitter no more. Release that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We release it. I want everybody just to take your hands in front of your body like this, like you're going to get a, you're going to cup it to get a drink of water. And you people that are struggling with a person, you're struggling with a hurt, something that somebody did, something happened to you, and you're mad at God or whatever. I just want you to visualize putting that hurt inside that cup of your hands. Just visualize it. Father, we speak over that hurt and we put the salve of the Holy Spirit on top of it right now. And we say, Holy Spirit, breathe on every hurt and bitterness in the room. And now we give it to you, Lord. I want you to just take your cup up like that and just raise your hands and just uncup them and say, we give it to you, Lord. Somebody say, I give it to you, Lord. Help me, Jesus. Do your will. Amen. Amen.